There's been a lot of changes in television since the 1950s, 60s, up until now. Equipment, editing techniques. Remember this in the morning, color bars with tone, followed by this test pattern. Well, this test pattern was used to check something on the transmitter in the morning, and they had to have this pattern and a thousand cycle tone. Sometimes it ran for a half hour. And what made this? Something called a monoscope. This tube had the test pattern etched into it, and it was all run from vacuum tubes. They didn't have transistors in those days. Now, if you wanted to get into television at the time, where do you get your experiences? A good spot was the Army, Air Force, or Navy. They had a great television course. Of course, in those days, 1950s, 1960s, everything was vacuum tubes. But you got your hands on the equipment, and it's pretty hard to do. Even this 250-pound color camera. And some people got started in the business in the small local TV station as a camera person or as a technician in the control room of the 1950s. Pretty old. Take a look at all the lenses on this black and white camera. It was called a turret. Here's a variety of cameras, all of them black and white, except the one in the back. That was color. Notice all these lenses in the front? Well, it made a lot of noise when you turned those lenses from the turret uh, grip in the back. But if you wanted to get a telephoto shot, that's what you had to use until these zoom lenses came out. It took a specially and highly trained technician to keep these cameras working and aligned. They were complex, and of course everything in those days was made from vacuum tubes. This was the modern camera back in the 1950s, and of course black and white color didn't exist then. What's on the inside? Well, on one side a lot of electronic components. On the other side, adjustments and some vacuum tubes, and who knows what else. This is Chuck Paris, the gentleman that saved all these cameras from the junk pile and has a mini museum. He also brings the cameras to the National Broadcasters Association show, which is held in Las Vegas. Thanks, Chuck, for saving this piece of history. In the early 1960s, there were two post-production centers located in New York City, the Videotape Center and this place called Reeves Video. Reeves Video was located about a block from the United Nations. Take a look at the vacuum tube video tape machines. It took three racks of equipment to make a tape machine transport system and two racks in the back and one rack just for color and it all ran on vacuum tubes. This row of equipment sitting on an angle were actually the control panels for a color television camera, a film chain, and a black and white television camera. These were the racks that controlled the transport servo for the wheels to roll the tape back and forth. They weren't needed up front, so they were located in the back room out of the way. This was called a film chain, a 16 millimeter projector, a 35 millimeter projector, and a slide projector. It could go to a black and white camera or it could be projected into a color camera. This plexiglass was put over the record button because sometimes you hit it by accident when you hit the play button and you started to erase your tape. Not, not a good thing. What did the picture look like? Well, something like this. And sometimes it looked like that. And how do you fix it? Well, there's an adjustment on the video head that he has to tweak to get those lines straight. Oh, it was fun. Now we get into the videotape editing, the hard way. Note the big gizmo on top of the table. It's a guillotine. You actually had to cut the tape. This is what it looks like. It was made by Ampex. To edit, the videotape had to actually be cut. The tape was two inches wide, and in order to see where the recording was, you had to spray on a solution of freon and magnesium. When the freon evaporated, the magnesium stuck to the recorded area and you can see where things were. A big problem is when you cut the tape where you want the video, the audio was downstream about four inches and you cut the audio for the next scene. It was a nightmare to do it this way. When the cut was made down the center of the guard band, you had to foil tape the two pieces together and hope it didn't catch in the head when you played it back. Editing by cutting the tape was difficult but there was help on the way. The Ampex Corporation developed a new machine, all of transistors, and bingo, everything got much easier. You could now electronically edit, 
and not have to cut the tape anymore. From this first early transistor machine to this called an Ampex 2000, when this machine came out in the 1970s, post-production just exploded. Tape houses were all over the place. Now you could record a pretty good color picture. And when you recorded something like from NBC, you couldn't take the chance in recording just one machine, so you had to record on two machines at the same time in case one machine died. Think about all the people on stage out in Brooklyn doing the Frank Sinatra show, and you say you lost the recording because one machine died. You had to record on two machines. Then when you played back a show, when it was all through being edited and so forth, you played the show back on two machines at one time. And then the left machine was the air machine. The right machine, you had to synchronize it with the air machine. You did that by listening to the audio. When the two machines were synchronized, you told the technician at the other end, you're in sync. So if one machine quit, he could switch to the other. From electronic editing, it went to computer editing. And then later on, it went down to small computer editing, which you could do at your home. But this machine here revolutionized television. RCA invented the first television camera. It had three pickup tubes, one for red, green, and blue. The top half is the monitor. The whole thing weighed about 250 pounds on the pedestal. And once it was aligned, the picture was pretty good, but there was a problem. The things would drift electronically. And during a show or live shoot, you'd have to turn the camera to a test pattern, realign it quickly, and then get it back on the stage. It was one man's job just to take care and maintain and operate this camera and make the picture look good. And today, the 1,000 pound tape machine, the 200 pound camera, all boils down into one pound. This small consumer camera costs about $350 and the picture is just as good as some of the more expensive ones, like this Canon. This is a Canon semi-professional camera. It costs about $1,800. The microphone on top is called a shotgun mic. It kind of aims the sound in the directions you want. You don't have to use it. There's two built-in microphones on the camera. But it's a nice feature. This is the controls. If you have an auxiliary microphone on a cable running across the floor with what they call XL connectors. Everything goes to little memory cards. And of course, there's some internal memory too. Pop the card out and put it in your computer. And you got a picture like this. You can start editing. This is a Grass Valley editing program. It's far beyond cutting videotape in the old days with a guillotine. We can put a motion picture up in this panel here. We can go to something called a bin. That's like digging in the old shoebox for your photographs. So we'll click on this one and that'll come up here. And if we hit the play button, it starts to play. Now we can pick a spot by sliding this thing back and forth, hit this and say start here. Notice this is dark gray and this is light gray. And we can drag or play our scene down to here and say this is the out point. Now you'll note there's a dark gray, a light gray, and a dark gray. When we hit this little blue button here, it'll take just this one piece and drop it down right here where our cursor is. We'll put the cursor right there, hit the blue button, and bang, and there's our video. Now we can play it, and we can add it to this scene here, and when we, when we play it, it will cut from one scene to the other. Or, if we want to get fancy, we can go to something called effects, and we can go over here and hit something three-dimensional effects, and have a a four-page peel by dra dragging the effects over the top of this. It renders instantaneously. Now we hit play, watch the screen. We can make that effect last longer. Go back and play it again, and now watch up here. Here comes the effect, and it tears open slowly. Well, maybe we don't like it. We can hit the delete button, and it's, it's back to a cut. The point here is the editing system of today has gotten very sophisticated and very good. Something like this in the past would have probably cost $50,000 and you can get this editing system for about $200. There's quite a few out there. 
Final Cut Pro is the Macintosh editing system and uh, very popular among the Macintosh people. That used to cost about a thousand dollars. Now the new Final Cut Pro X is about three hundred dollars. In this case, this is Grass Valley's program. There's also, um, oh gosh, uh, Sony's got one and Adobe Premiere's got one. I guess it's what you get used to or what you first get your hand onto. The days of the 200 pound color camera and the 1000 pound tape machines are over. If you want to get involved in making some videos and find out how to edit, well there's an easy way. Contact Upstream and get some lessons and shoot some movies for the cable access channel. And the days of the test pattern are also gone. And how often do you see this annoying thing? Well, at one time, the color bars were needed on the head of every videotape, so when you played back the tape, you set the color bars to a house standard. It's not done anymore. It's all done with the computer at your home.